Uh, welcome everyone to our first Andwise Community Hour. The whole point of starting to do these things was so we can start meeting in an informal setting and learn from each other and some from some professionals. I'm really excited to introduce uh, Tanya Frias, who's our new lead for financial education. She's got over 20 years experience in wealth management and financial planning. And uh, we're, we're really lucky to have her at Andwise. Um, today, we've figured that since a lot of people's questions are about where to start in the realm of optimizing your financial wellness, we both thought that a good place to start would be at the beginning, which many people consider having a written financial plan. And in my experience, I finished residency in 2012. I've been a practicing hospital medicine physician for more than 10 years now. And early on in my career, even more than half my career, I guess my plan, like many physicians, was just earning more money than I spent. And I think that's a big mistake, not having a written plan. But I'll let Tanya introduce herself and then we'll go from there. Awesome. Good to meet everyone. Like Dr. Verma said, my name is Tanya Frias. Yes, I've worked in financial services for around over 20 years. At this point, I'm a certified financial planner and I'm also a chartered special needs consultant. So that just means that I have extra training on working with special needs families. Um, and just to piggyback on what Dr. Verma said, having a plan is super important. It's just like trying to get to a destination. If you don't know how to get there, it makes it very hard to get there. We're just going to go into a bit more detail on what it looks like to put a plan together for yourself and the areas that are important, especially for our physician community. Awesome. Thank you. To start, when people are thinking about writing their financial plan, I'm sure there's like infinite variations you can do depending on if you have a partner, don't have a partner, dependents, all that jazz. But what are some of the three or four like foundational or absolutely must include things that you think you've seen over the course of your career? Having a good idea of where you're at right now is a good place to start. I've had a couple of conversations with um, some folks in our community already when I ask the question, do you have an idea of what your cash flow looks like right now? And then I have an idea. An idea is not going to cut it. We need to know where we're at right now. So having a good handle on where your money's going is going to be the first start to figure out where you want it to go in the future and what you want it to do for you. So for sure, having some sort of idea of what your net worth looks like, the value of your assets, your student loans having those organized in a clear way by issuer, interest rate, all of these things are super important because once you have all these details, then you know where to start and what process to implement. So that way you can get to your goals faster. And the second thing is figuring out what you want to do. What are your goals? And that sounds really simple, but it's not. Right. So when um, people talk about uh, building wealth, they say, I just want to retire comfortably or I want to cover my kids education. It, it's too vague. We need to get really clear on what that looks like. So if you want to retire comfortably, what does that mean? How much money would you need um, annually to cover your expenses and what type of expenses do you anticipate in retirement when it comes to having goals that have your family first and foremost? ensuring that your children education is covered. What type of education are we talking about? Are they going to be doctors like you? At least maybe that's what you want them to do, whether they do it or not is a different thing. <laughs> Just having the nuts and bolts around what these goals are so you can start planning. And the other thing I want people to know is that financial planning is not static. It, it changes all the time. You can put a plan in place today and six months from now, Something can be going on with your life and you can make some changes and that's okay. Certainly having an idea of where you're at right now, what these destinations look like in detail, and then start implementing a plan going forward to reach those goals and understanding that life happens. Things happen all the time, but making the plan flexible enough so you can adjust to those changes. We threw out a couple of terms there for absolute newbies. 
net worth, obviously, Andwise is building a lot of this technology. We're going to have an integrated financial platform in the coming months. We don't have that right now, but when we do, you'll be able to see your net worth once you've connected your accounts. In a general sense, is net worth just people's assets minus their liabilities, or is there something more they should be looking for? Yeah, so that's it's everything that you own a value, right? You attach a value to it. So if you have investments, it's pretty easy to get the value of those investments. If you have traditional liquid investments like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and your 401k, um, those are pretty easy to, val to value. Real estate, the value of your home, which could change. So having the value of those things and people have tangible assets like art, sneakers have been a big thing <laughs> lately. I have met a ton of people who have a very expensive sneaker collection worth a lot of money. Whatever it is that you own that has value, then minus all of your debt, any credit card debt, student loan debt, there might be personal debt. Everyone's situation is different. Any amount that you would owe that you need to pay back. So it would be the value of all these assets minus what you owe, and that would be your net worth. Now, for the folks early in their career, and if you have student loans, it's likely that net worth will be negative. It's okay. It happens all the time. <laughs> We're just striving to get it not negative. So the smaller that number gets, the better off you'll be. But I tend to warn people that there may be that your net worth is negative and that's okay and we're just working to get it to the positive great besides the actual numbers component of all of your assets your liabilities and, and how much you calculate you need to spend in retirement what else goes into creating a written financial plan i i only ask because this is a very personal pro process. So I haven't seen very many. One of my closest friends from med school shared his with me, and it actually has components of an insurance plan, mm -hmm. how much term life insurance they're going to have. It has components of a housing plan. They, they own a house on a very low interest rate, but it's not their dream house. Him and his wife went, went down and wrote, they are not going to sell this house until interest rates come back down, like in the current environment. We said at the start of the call, there's infinite other things that you, you could probably add to a written financial plan. Is is insurance something that you typically go over with like clients, like life insurance, disability insurance? Yes. Full financial planning in general has different areas. One of the areas is your investment plan, your insurance plan, like your risk management part of your financial plan, retirement planning. What does it look like when you're no longer working? And it also includes your estate plan. A lot of people, especially early in their careers, don't think that it's important to have an estate plan, but everyone needs an estate plan. Simplest form, having power attorneys and health proxies, proxies in place, which you all know is super, super important. That is something that will be included in your financial plan. Like Dr. Verma just mentioned, this one couple as an example, they have specific goals when it comes to their home. Everyone's plan is going to look a little bit different. The plan itself will be customized to your goals, but there are certain components, like when I talk about an estate plan, that's just the plan that you have in place that directs where you want your assets to go if you pass away, ensuring that things go where you want it to go or if you're incapacitated. So you cannot make decisions for yourself in case being admitted into a hospital and not being able to direct your doctor as to what your wishes are. You usually assign someone to do those things and that's part of your estate plan. In terms of real estate, it's not everyone's goal to own a home. Some people just don't have that as top of mind. They're perfectly fine renting forever. But if home ownership is a priority, that would be part of your plan as well. And also tax planning. Now, financial planners do not do your taxes unless they are enrolled agents or CPAs. So the tax planning component of your financial plan is just the tax consideration of where you hold your assets and what type of assets you have in place. For example, if you own bonds, which spit off interest, you probably want to own that in your retirement account so you don't have to pay income tax on that income. When you talk to a planner and they talk about tax planning, it's just 
in reference to how we hold your assets so that they're in the most tax advantage place. That makes sense. And then, I'm sorry, I'm going slightly off script from the questions. One thing that I was wondering was when you first initially meet with clients, mm-hmm. I see a lot of chatter amongst physicians about like, how much do I actually need to retire? As a non-financial professional that dabbles in reading stuff, I've heard some like rules. I don't know if they're still valid. Like some people talk about the 4% rule uh, that you yeah. know, the, the day you retire, your bucket of accessible funds, or actually I'm not sure if it's your bucket of accessible funds or if it's your net worth, but you multiply that by 4% and that's the amount that's like safe to take out every year and spend. Um, yeah. like, do you, do you, is it a process that you work backwards with people? For instance, like if you're a pediatrician, I'm just making up numbers, but if you're mm-hmm. a pediatrician and you make $150,000 in that person's mind to maintain their current lifestyle, again, I don't know all the assumptions, but are they just taking 150,000 dividing by 0.04, which is 4% and looking mm-hmm. at that figure, which is like 3.75 million and being like, oh my gosh, that's what I need to retire. Or like, how do you work backwards from figuring out? Like, It depends. If you're working with someone who's younger, so someone in their 20s and 30s will maybe want to talk about retirement, but it's so far away that when that, whatever number we come up with today is likely to change. Their life is going to change in the next 10, 15, 20 years. If I have someone that's closer to retirement, it's just a matter of taking the value of their liquid asset, that's their retirement accounts, their investment accounts. I'm also considering any additional income that they may be getting during retirement. Let's say they have rental real estate. So taking the value of all those assets and applying a a cash flow number, the amount that they need every single year, it's important to incorporate that number after tax. This is not the income that you would be getting before you pay your taxes. You, your, your target is what you'd get into your bank account every single month. You would start that way. Now, the 4% rule is just an easy way to get that number. Let's say someone has a million dollars, and that basically says that they can spend $40,000 a year. Now, if the market is down and inflation is high, that 4% will still hurt you. The general rule when interest rates were really low and inflation was low was 4%. It was very easy to do that. Today, if you have someone retiring today and inflation at the rate that it's at and interest rates where they're at, that number might look a little bit different. You can start with a rule like that. Keep in mind that as time goes on, it may change because your lifestyle may change. But you do need something. You need a point of reference to start and building out what the plan is with consideration that it may change over time. I'm asking these questions because I see them all the time from physicians online. Besides your um, C, are there other professionals that we need to engage, like as early career physicians, to create this sort of financial plan? One example that I'm thinking of specifically is taxes. We all want to pay our legal share of taxes, whatever we're Mm -hmm. obligated, but there's certain strategies you can use to minimize taxes, like tax advantage retirement accounts. Is that something that the CFP goes over with you during financial planning, or do most people have to engage like someone separate, like a tax attorney or something? So as part of the training as a certified financial planner, we do spend a lot of time in taxes. A CFP would know what the current tax rates are, what advantages would you have when you use retirement accounts. They'll know all of these things. What they may not be equipped to do is actually file your taxes. They can tell you if you own your own business that you could deduct your business expenses, like things like that, they'll know. And they could consider your current tax situation when they're putting a plan together for you, but they most likely will not be processing your tax returns for you unless they offer that service. And another thing I want to clarify, a CFP designation just means that you've gone through this training to be a financial planner. The training for a CFP when I passed the exam was about two years of instruction. And then there was a 10 hour exam 
and you also need to have about 6,000 hours to get the certification. So not easy. However, there are financial planners out there that do not have their CFP and they're probably great planners. The designation just gives you an idea that this person has gone through this training and has expertise when it comes to financial planning. The other word that gets thrown out a lot is that as a financial advisor, the CFP can be a financial advisor. There's no designation for financial advisor. Anyone can say they're a financial advisor. You have these terms, but since that term doesn't have a specific designation or training, the CFP gives you an additional feeling of security that this person knows what they're doing. Did I answer your question, Dr. Vern? Yeah. I have one additional follow-up was the specific case I was thinking about, and I still haven't figured out how I would have done this differently, but like when I finished residency, I had W-2 income from being an employee of a mm -hmm. hospital system, but then I also had a side gig and I made 1099 income, which is for people listening. If you're an independent contractor and not classified as an employee, they give you a form at the end of the year that shows how you were paid 1099 instead of the W-2 form. And usually your taxes aren't taken out. So the onus is on you to write the government a check and mail it in both state and federal taxes. And then at yeah. the end of the year, your, your accountant, I don't know what the right word is, accounts for all these numbers in your tax return. But my, my question is that even though I had an accountant, I never had a financial planner, wealth manager, advisor. And what ended up happening was that I, I didn't realize that in addition to the regular retirement account that everyone's heard of, the 401k, which I got from that W-2 section of my income, I could have also opened up my own other retirement accounts. And I don't know all the specifics, but I've heard some like a SEP IRA. I've heard about individual uh, 401ks. Mm -hmm. and, it, and now looking back at it, I'm like, wow, that's a lot of money I could have stocked away with some sort of tax deferral. Now, it doesn't make it tax free. Uh, eventually, uh, at some stage, you get taxed on it. But the hope is that your, at least the, the people that I've heard from, the hope is that you're in a different tax bracket later on when it does get taxed. But anyway, my question is now thinking back, I'm just thinking, who would have I, who would have told me that? It's just like such an unknown. Do accountants usually go over stuff like that? Do financial planners? Who's so the financial planners do go over those things now. There's a couple of points I want to touch on. When you have a relationship with your financial planner, it's pretty proactive. You are making a plan. You have an idea of what you're going to do going forward to reach your goals. Most people do not engage with their accountant that way, and they should. Most people engage their accountant, even me sometimes. I'm picking up the phone three weeks before I have to pay my taxes. And then the accountant's putting all these people, you can do this. And it may seem burdensome because we didn't make a plan. You can have a proactive relationship with your tax professional. You can plan out what these things look like. As Dr. Verma was talking about, let's say you had a proactive relationship with your tax professional. You would have said to them, yes, I have this W-2 income and I'm also expecting this 1099 income. What can I do today? What can I do before I file my taxes to ensure that I'm getting the best tax advantages or saving money or whatever it is your goal is, then you can do those things because to open an individual 401k, it does not take three weeks. It takes more time than that. So you're going to be rushing to try to open these type of accounts before the deadline so you can take these advantages. Now, your planner would know these things. Your accountant knows these things. The trouble is that you probably did not engage your tax professional in time so that you can implement these um, accounts so that you can get the advantages. That's with the case if you did not have a financial planner. The other thing, your, your tax professional is trying to reduce your taxes. That's their objective. You are paying them so that you can pay as little taxes as possible. What they're not considering is all of your other financial goals. I have engaged physicians in the past who have just had 
tax professionals, they have CPAs, they've never worked with the planner, and they are literally socking away every single dollar that they have in their retirement accounts, but then they have minimal liquid assets. The, the, the tail was wagging the dog. Having these two professionals work together and planning beforehand is super important. I would recommend that everyone going forward tries to have a proactive relationship with their accountant. If you do have a planner, make sure they speak to each other. That way you're touching on all your goals, obviously not trying not to pay um, an extraordinary amount of taxes, but also at the same time, trying to reach your financial goals. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. In my case, in the first half decade, maybe longer of my career, it was just extremely reactive, like at tax mm -hmm. time and this is what I've done. And there was barely anything to be done at the end of the year. Cause those limits yeah. sometimes have to be done before December 31st as well. It's not even, yes. April, it's not even April 15th. So you've already missed it. If you're doing your, if you're just having your one meeting for the year with your accountant in yep. February or March, you've already missed it. Not, not to mention that like saving money is also <laughs> requires a lot of planning. Talking about liquid assets, segueing off that, is there, is it obviously when you're a medical student, you're in debt, you have no income. Essentially, you're, if you have student loans, you're just using those funds to pay for your expenses, your education. Then when you've transitioned to being a resident, because CMS, Medicare, Medicaid pays for residency training spots. Their income limits are capped anywhere from 50 to 75K, depending on cost of living adjustment. They also probably don't have the opportunity to save a lot of money. Once you're an attending physician, is there some ballpark figure that, that a lot of physicians, the majority of physicians can use? as a percentage that they should be trying to save. I've heard just in non-physician blogs, a lot of people mention you should try to save 10 to 20% of your post-tax income. Now that's an incredibly large range. And again, it depends on if your spouse or partner, or you have other source of income, but is there any sort of number that you go over with your clients where you're, you're like, you should try to work to this. And before you answer, actually, let's ask Dr. Lowe and give you time to think about your answer. Hi, sir. Wait, I, I got to apologize. I'm doing this between patients right now. Yeah. So, but he, I wanted to get on this call only because I have been approached by the fellows of the California chapter American College Cardiology to talk to them about a number of issues. One of the things they're interested in are the financial issues of starting in practice. What I want to do is punt them to Andwise. Okay. So what I'm going to do is if you can send me just some summary materials that I put together and send to the fellows in training in the cardiology fellowship of the American College of Cardiology. There's a whole bunch of members in it and they're interested in it. And when I saw that, I said, I got to get on this call because even though it's, this is not a good time for me, this is a, time wise is bad, but I wanted to, when I freed up my time, I wanted to be able to get to you. So send stuff to me on my email. I got to get off right now, yeah. okay. <laughs> but, and then I can pass it on to those guys and let them follow up with you all. Yeah. We appreciate okay. it. Thank you so Thank much. You. Okay. <laughs> all right. I, I'm really normally part of this group. It's just the timing's not good for me on Tuesday afternoons. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for making time. Okay, guys. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So, Sorry, Tanya. So I was That's a okay. little ver verbose, but just to, uh, just to remind you, saving money is hard for everyone, but mm -hmm. uh, obviously every individual's case is different. Our, our financial obligations are different, dependents we have, but is there like in your ideal world, if you started working with someone early and, and they weren't in dire straits like credit card debt, Mm -hmm. And they just had the average amount of student loans, which average I'm smirking. It's ridiculous amount right now. If you have loans, it's like above 200,000, right? But if they were someone like that, but didn't have credit card debt, um, what is the number? Is there a number that people should be shooting for? To so say this is, this is not specific to physicians, but in general people, you should have around three to six months worth of your monthly expenses in an emergency savings account. If you're a single person, three to six months is awesome. If you have a family, you may want to strive for a little bit more just in case anything happens. You have assets, you have funds that you could access. Now I do want to touch on residents. Just because you have student loans doesn't mean you can't save. 
let's be honest, there's a whole bunch of plans in place that will help you figure out what that monthly payment is. You can find a way to do both, even if it's $10 a week, I don't care what it is. Try to do both at the same time. The other thing I wanna to touch on is that paying down your debt is a form of investing. Putting money towards that debt every single month and paying it down as soon as possible frees up cash flow. It's just a different form of investing. Now, student loans, I mean, in terms of whether it's good or bad debt, it's not bad debt. It's, it's usually an extraordinary amount because of the careers that you guys are in. Now I have a huge student loan, it's terrible. Um, but you can pay it down and the, you do have time to pay it down. The sense of urgency to pay it down, it depends on the person. There are some people who want to get it paid off as soon as possible and will put every single penny towards that loan. And there are other people who are just saying, look, I just need to make the payment so I'm current and have flexibility until I'm making more money and I could really pay it down a lot faster. There's a bunch of ways to approach this. I don't want um, residents um, feeling like they can't save, especially in the event of emergency. It's very important for you to put money aside just in case there's an emergency. I've, I think they've done studies that, I mean, there's a whole percentage of the American public that couldn't get through a $900 emergency payment. If they had to pay for something that would be $900, it put them in a financial bind. You don't want anyone to be in that situation. So saving is still important. Now, 10%, 20%, that all depends. Everyone's life is different. Everyone's cash flow is different. Everyone's expenses are different. It'd be wonderful if you could save 20% a year, but also think about what are you sacrificing to save $20,000 a year? Are you home eating ramen noodles because you want to save 20% of your income? I don't know if that's, if that's fine for you, great. But if you want to have some semblance of a life that you can enjoy, there's a happy medium that you can meet with your financial plan and your savings plan. So that way you can try to do both. But saving, no matter where you're at in your um, career, is super important. That's awesome advice. We'll open it up to questions in a second if there are some. But just to recap the essential elements of a financial plan, it sounds like you definitely need a spending plan, mm -hmm. a savings plan, an investing plan. If you have student loans, you need a student loan plan. And then you mentioned the estate plan. and Estate, estate plan, plan and retirement planning, which sometimes it's in the investment plan, but it's just, it's a, it's a specific goal. There are tons of instances where I've worked with younger clients and they're like, I can't even put my mind around retirement. I just want to save enough money so that way I have the flexibility to do what I want to do as opposed to what I have to do. That is a real goal. A lot of people have that goal. Retirement has been a word lately that doesn't get used as often um, when you are having conversations with 30, sometimes even 40 year olds. They're just looking to have financial flexibility. And what does that mean in terms of a number and time frame? That's where you figure out the plan. And then, so how often should people revisit these plans? Like the clients you've worked with, you, you have the initial meeting, they go off, they fill out worksheets for you but I'm just assuming. Then you meet again, create a written plan, they sign it, hopefully it's mutually agreed upon. And is this something that you revisit with clients like quarterly, once a year, or when there's a change in life event? What's the optimal time we should be looking at? So like, I'm going to say it depends again, <laughs> only because bare minimum, you should be looking at your plan once a year. That is if you've created a full financial plan. Lately, what I've done over the past five years is focusing on plans that are a bit more agile. They're not this full blown up hundred page plan that says do all these things um, because most people don't do it. They don't follow through unless you're facilitating the implementation. There may be a case where you work on this plan over time. So you create goals for yourself all the things you need to do over the next three months to tackle one area, you could do the next area in three months, things like that. If you have a traditional plan, everything's spelled out for you, definitely check in at least once a year 
or if there's a life event, you're switching jobs, you get married, you have children, someone passes away, all these life events would justify looking at your plan. The other time it's super important is open enrollment. Anyone who's working W-2 job, October, November is the time you look at your health benefits or whatever benefits your employer is offering. That is a time to look at your financial plan as well. So that way you make sure you, you, you pick the right option. Take advantage of whatever's being offered to you at that time. That's great advice. Thank you. Did you have anything to add to what we've talked about? For instance, any common mistakes or anything that I've left out? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think some of the common mistakes I've seen a lot with physicians, especially if they're younger, even if they have student loans, they really have this thing in their head where they're just going to make a lot of money and they're going to be fine. They're going to have more than enough money to cover whatever it is that they want to do. And that's not true. It's very easy to spend more money when you make more money. The idea that you're betting on making large salaries can cover anything that you want to accomplish is probably not true. People, ultra wealthy people have financial plans as well. It's very important to put a, a plan in place. The other thing is just feeling overwhelmed. Sometimes I sit here and think about all the things that I have to put in place when it comes to my finances and it's overwhelming, but it's okay. It's not, that's a situation that everyone at some point in their life has felt overwhelmed. That's when you get help. You also don't have to spend a lot of money to get help. There are ways that you can get help from a professional within your budget. There's a lot of innovation lately when it comes to financial planning. There are planners that we've seen that have programs in place specifically to help people who are early in their career and can't spend $10,000 for a financial plan. There's ways to get help. And the most important thing you can do is just get started and putting a plan together. Yeah. I think one of the best ways that people can get started is by talking to you since we're <laughs> so lucky to have you on our Andwise team now. So I'm just going to share my screen and show them the people that are on the call and later for the recording. But if you just go to joinandwise.com and then you go down here to the complimentary financial education consult and you can book time with Tanya for about like empowerment for mm -hmm. medical students, residents, fellows, early career physicians. And so these sessions aren't any sort of sales funnel to any more paid coaching service, anything like that. We're really trying to do it as a benefit and service to the physician community. And we're so lucky we have a team member that has decades of experience in this field. I shared with Tanya the other day, someone's post online about how they had six figures just sitting around in a checking account and they had done nothing with it because they were too scared to act. It was, I guess, decision paralysis. And a, a lot of times, as we've all heard in different quotes, compounding is like the eighth wonder of the world. So the more time that you lose, it's you're shooting yourself in the foot with that. Yeah, also I've had a, a number of these calls already. As Dr. Verma mentioned, we're not selling anything. It really is, if you have any questions about um, getting started, your current plan, I'm there for, to answer those questions. I met with someone yesterday who works with a planner and had questions about their plan and they just simply did not know how to use the software that their planner uses. So I showed them how to use it so they can now see. It could be anything, even if you're working with someone and you have questions. I've had a number of calls I'm focused on how much should they be paying to work with the planner? Again, that all depends. So we had that conversation. It really is any question you have when it comes to getting started, whatever plan you have in place or what you're looking to do in the future. Yeah, thank you. Does anyone have any questions from the audience? There's a couple of medical students on the call. The more information sharing that happens and we can learn from actual financial professionals like Tanya being on our team, the less uncertainty there is, the more action takes place, 
and the more empowered people feel. Because sometimes I, I feel like a lot of groups online, it's unfortunately the blind leading the blind, and we really need professionals to help us. And that's where Andwise steps in. Version one is with our team, and then shortly we're going to have the actual technology platform to augment the human help that we have. So does anyone have any questions? I know Drewville had asked about estate planning. Tanya answered that one. Okay, Glenn, yeah, go ahead. Um, My internet's pretty unstable, so okay. I might try to type this in the chat if you can't hear me, but thank you so much, Tanya. I was wondering, as a, as a medical student, what should we, should I be doing? Should medical students be doing to prepare financially I got the first half of that question. So I don't know if you had any additional detail, but generally probably your biggest concern, you have two big concerns. Where are you going to start your residency program? How much is this program going to pay you? And then your student loans are probably top of mind. So having an idea of, of where you're at or where you expect to be when you start this program. And I believe they all have to pay when you're starting a program, if you have to move to start a program, all of these expenses. So having an idea of where you're at, it's the same for someone coming out of medical school as it is for anyone else looking to ensure that they have a plan in place. Definitely have a good idea of what the current situation is and what your goals are during this time. Some goals you have you want to accomplish them in two years, three years, and retirement goal is super far away for someone coming out of medical school, but figure out what the goals are in the shorter term and start having a plan in place for those. It's just baby steps, because if you put something in place early, it's much easier for you to make changes later on based on your income situation, your um, career situation, you'll have a lot more flexibility if you start early. I would say have a plan in place to accomplish the goals that you have in the shorter term. And that would be anything under five years and having an assessment of where you're currently at and what your expenses will be. Drew, go ahead. Yeah, th have a question. Thanks guys. I wanted to build off of Glenn's question. Now that I've just very recently started residency, wanted to touch on the fact that now that there's some minimal income there, I know that a lot of what was discussed as being a medical student, assessing where you're at and a plan for paying down your debt are the major paradigms. Uh, but considering like starting residency and having at least some income, what are other specific paradigms you recommend I can focus on? Is this a time to at least begin thinking about building wealth? Are there avenues to do that even with the sort of minimal income that's there? And if so, what are some like easy kind of cost effective, but because residency is busy, low effort ways to begin engaging in that. Um, having obviously a, a repayment plan is one component. The other component is um, what Dr. Verma touched on is having a savings plan with a target emergency amount. So what three to six months worth of your expenses, putting a plan in place to save for that. You could even start investing, even if it's $10 at each time. Robinhood, Charles Schwab, all of these platforms have programs where you can add consistently to your investments. And I also think try to embrace technology as much as possible. The more you automate the movement of money, whether it be to a loan, an investment account, or a savings account, the better off you'll be. If you have to remember to move the money yourself, it makes it a lot harder. I currently, I have my savings plan in place that takes money out on the days that I know I'm getting paid. That way, I, whatever's left over, that's mine. Automating your savings and your debt payments is going to be key to sticking to a plan and building wealth. And remember, it's likely that your net worth is negative when you look at the assessment, especially if you've just gotten out of school and you have this um, big student loan, but that's okay. That plan and that movement of money every single month is the way you're investing for your cash flow and your net worth going forward. But automating those payments is super important. Um, and tons of banks have this. A lot of online banks have it. They're 
is one um, company called Capital um, that allows you to put all these rules in place. That way you save consistently. Let's say it will connect to your bank account. And every time you make a purchase, it will round it up to whatever dollar you say. Let's say I want to round it up to $5. It'll take that money automatically and move it into your savings account. They're not the only company that does that, by the way. A lot of companies have these automated savings plans in place. And I think that's super helpful for people starting in the beginning and getting into the habit of saving and paying down debt consistently. I appreciate that. Like those recommendations are pretty helpful because that's the transition I'm slowly making now. Just on a personal note, one thing that I've always been hesitant with is like this automation because I feel like I, I need to know where everything is at a specific time. But I think uh, start small. But... Start small. I was the same way. I, I don't let anything come out of my account that's over two hundred dollars unless I know what it is and I did it. So <laughs> I understand that, but start small. Appreciate that recommendation. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what my wife has been telling me as well. She's a lot more uh, practically smart than I am and, and has been telling me about automating credit card payments, for example, mm -hmm. taking advantage of those points. Don't let the balance show up before your statement comes out to help with your credit score, for example. And so, oh, and it's also a tax free yeah. loan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> no, thank you. You're welcome. All right. I think we're almost at the eight o'clock mark. I think we might wrap up unless anyone else has anything to add. So as a, as a reminder, Tanya's complimentary sessions are, are on the joinandwise.com site. We're going to try to do this community hour again in two weeks with a different topic. Thank you for everyone that participated. We know it's not easy to take an hour out of your already very busy lives and for anyone that's watching the recording later, please let us know how we can help where we're here to help. And our small team is slowly trying to create tools and technology solutions to empower the whole community. So thanks again and good night. Thank you, Tanya. Good night. Thank you very much.